So now I'm very glad to welcome Professor Yeran Kim, who will present towards digital modus vivendi living together through uh, connections. Uh, Yeran Kim is professor in the School of Communications, Gwangun University in South Korea. She has extensively published a number of papers and books, including Idol Republic, Global Emergence of Girl Industries and Commercialization of Girl Bodies, Eating as a Transgression, Multisensorial Performativity in the Corner Video of Mukbang, that's eating shows on YouTube. Her current research focuses on the cultural intersection of effect, com communication, and society in the contemporary social media ecology. I had the privilege to read her keynote speech as a chair, and I'm sure it will provide tremendous insights on connected learning theory and practices based on her observations of how young people in South Korea might be living together through online connections. I would like to ask the audience to think about whether and how her observations of young people's digital lives might apply in your context and what it would mean for research and practices in connected learning. The speech will be about 40 minutes and there will be a questions and answer session for 15 minutes. Please leave your comments, appreciations and questions in the chat while you are listening. Yeran could answer the questions after her speech. And now without further ado, Here's our great keynote speaker, Professor Yeran Kim. Thank you, Anson, for the nice introduction. So, shall I start with the sharing of my PPT? Anson, could you? Yeah. Thank you, Hyunsan and everyone. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm very honored to give the closing keynote speech of 2022, the Connected Learning Summit in Asia and Australia. The title I want to discuss today is Toward Digital Models of Vivendi Living Together Through Connections. In this talk, I propose then young people today not only learn specific knowledge, information, or skills, but do almost everything involving life, such as work, play, meeting, and loving or hating people online. Thus, what seems to me important to me in relation to the subject of connected learning is less a specific area of education of skills than ways of living in a broader sense. This question is crucial in the sense that we need to change the way of questioning in terms of thinking about those who are called digital native. Digital native is a, is a term based on the instance of being born. And what I would like to elaborate is what has been happening after their birth this is a processual approach to digital natives concerning how they grow up, what kinds of people they become, what they want to do, both for making a living and for their free time, what forms of social life and political collectivity are being made or will be created in their digitalized lives. I will talk about these questions under the title of toward this modus of event living together through connections today. This paper discusses how young people do not simply learn, but also begin to practice their lives as an adult, meaning social, economic, and political subject in the environment of this culture. The horizon of life is the line of a digital platform. Focusing on the Korean youth generation in their 20s, I attempt to describe them in four categories. First, pragmatic, 
second, entrepreneurial, third, political, and fourth, solitary. These categories are not mutually exclusive, but often overlap as they are intersectional and transformative. Each category is featured in first homo laborum, second homo economicus, third homo politicus, and fourth homo residential. To give you a brief introduction, the solitary, which is homo residential, refers to those who keep their distance from the social and pursue a minor life, meaning alternative modes of calm individual living while trying to meet and know someone like themselves in the online world. Cyberspace is an actual world for them to meet friends. They may be seen as alienated from the society, but they are actually highly involved in various alternative lifestyles online, such as LG LGBTQI, anti-marriage, or the polyamory lifestyle, but softly. The pragmatic, which is homo laboran, include those who use this media to manage their so-called ordinary lives in the actual world for shopping, working, and meeting friends. These media to them are important as an indispensable tool for managing life. They are not entirely observed or addicted to this technology, and they balance their offline sociality and online usefulness. The third group of the homo economicus, which is entrepreneurial, represent those who are busy following new trend of these technological inventions, e.g. NFT, non-fungible tokens, the metaverse, or financial investment. Their subjectivity is highly economy driven in neoliberal post capitalist regimes, which lead them to relentless competition and the elusive ambition of final success through this practice. The political, which is homo politicus, refers to those who think, discuss, proclaim together, and carry on political act. Political cooperation can be either constant and stable or voluntary and fleeting. However, it is obvious that numerous social changes nowadays are made through the mediation of political networking online and the impact of online political discourse and action are critical in Korea as well as in the world. In surveying each category of subject formation, through specific mode of daily engagement with the online media, I argue that the major component of current social conflict are generated from hostility between and within the different categories of modus of vivendi, a considerable part of which is intertwined with these activities and these relations. For the same reason, it also depend on how different young people build their own free, diverse, and coexistent relations between different modes of vivendi in the digital world. It is crucial that younger generations learn not only digital media as an instrument for living, but more significantly, co-making their way of life as such, which may be called digital modus of vivendi. Then I will elaborate each type of digital modus of vivendi. Type one, this is homo laborant, the pragmatic. First, the pragmatic denotes individuals who were born to be digital native and who have grown up as this human laborant within the established social order. This established social order means the heterosexual family a certain level of a higher education, professional or semi-professional skilled labor, having some property and so on. In particular, it is reported that almost 80% of youth in their upper teens go to universities. 
implying that almost everyone has a college degree nowadays in Korea. To those people, these technologies are like a natural environment for living as middle-class urban citizens. How is the homo laborance type reflected in young people's lives? It is noted that young people in their teens and twenties are not yet autonomous, independent citizens. They do not or cannot work as a full-time workers, meaning that they are economically dependent on their parents. Nevertheless, their cultural and technological capabilities exceed those of other generations. In other words, young people in their 20s find themselves in an unbalanced position, while their cultural and technological positions as consumers are enormously strong, their social position in an economic and political sense is feeble. I propose the concept of digital creative labor in terms of focusing on young people with excessive consumer user power and underdeveloped economic political power who were born and brought up in a digital consumerist, post-capitalist and precarious society. Digital creative labor is no full labor, but rather aspirational labor and free labor as Terranova said. Youth engaged in this type of labor spend their energy only on perpetually postponed dreams to realize economic success, cultural fun, and cultivation of the self. Digital technology provides digital creative labor as a useful condition in which without full qualification and with the nature of the digital network of openness, anyone can be present online. I researched some university students who are working to support companies of fashion, cosmetics, and food, etc. Their work involved using commodities and visualizing themselves with those goods on social media. They work under contract in terms of becoming so-called supporters with the expectation that this work experience will help them get employed in similar cultural industrial areas in the near future. The companies who employ them can expect a public relations effect through the supporters' natural behaviors. There are fluctuations and precarity of labor and the new capitalist spirit of creativity and freedom is fused as their work online and enjoyment of consumer culture may be the best choice that can be made via negotiation between the economic necessity of labor and cultural desire. Young people devoted to digital creative labor are driven by the imperative norms to be creative, Angela McLeod says, have a passion for conspicuous consumption and aspire to self-innovation, all of which have subjected to cruel optimism, Balan says. To quote my interviewees, who are university students and working as a Puma sportswear supporters, says, A, yes, the company checks things. As they are fashion companies, they see my daily looks on blogs, shoes, setting, the appearance in my photos on my blog and the number of visitors to it. And they pay for me monthly on the grounds of those data. They tell me to post something about Puma sportswear brand and sometimes they select an award good words. Yeren, don't you feel uncomfortable or coerced to do that because they watch you? I'm quite okay with it. I do this only because I love it, and it is my responsibility as a Puma supporter to agree to the things they request. Actually, they do not force me. They just tell me to share anything I have done. It is not big burden at all. At the same time, they cultivate their own economic rationality 
working under the principle of self-entrepreneurialism. However, they are never free or autonomous because they are under constant surveillance by the companies by which they are employed and anonymous viewers of their online performances. It is often observed that young people engaged in this creative labor are excessively conscious of their own bodies, spending every minute on managing their bodies to look super slim and beautiful. Another interview says, I'm working as a marketer and editor. My job involves reporting on events that S company hosts, and I interview designers working for S company. If I were a professional reporter, they have to pay me, but I'm working for free, and instead they give me a 200 US dollar voucher that can be used at S company shops. I'm very clever and control things. They use me and I use them, so I'm happy. Subsequently, although their work would seem to be producing a few photographs on social media, in actuality, their 24 hours, seven days are under control by corporate power and an anonymous population in society. Designing diet, diet meals to make photogenic bodies, producing and creating storylines of their postings, monitoring viewers' reactions to their work, networking, and so on. To recap, this uh, homo laboran is the articulation of young people's subjective will to succeed and enjoy cultural companies' strategy to utilize young people for their labor in natural appearances and corporate popular surveillance the creative labor of youth is interlaced with a post-capitalist crisis and the neoliberal ethos of selfhood as well. This analysis is situated particularly in the social conflict and struggles in Korea, where problems related to the precarity of the younger generation have been increasingly aggravated in the realm of embodied reality, whereas their these activities have been highly expressive in the realm of mediated reality. This creative labor is a mixture of the precarious young free labor, economic polarization, the expansion of cognitive and emotional labor, the boom of hedonistic consumerism, the economic and cultural celebration of creativity, and self-entrepreneurship, the technological saturation of this media, and the subjective and collective effect around the excitement and ambition, but also of anxiety and fear. Type two, these are homo politicus, political collectivity. This technology has enabled enabled lowering age and gender barriers in political engagement among young people. For example, since a few years ago, Korean society has seen a huge emergence of popular radical digital feminism among young women. The Me Too movement, which originated in Western societies, had strong influences in Korean society to the extent of turning every patriarchal social order upside down. In central and local government, public institutions, the education sector, art and culture, as well as general working places. Young women's active practices and support of the Me Too movement as a political movement toward happiness have been possible mainly due to the young growing younger female generation who are digitally savvy and critical toward the traditional gender regime in Korea. Feminist anthropologist Kim Hyun Mi coined the phrase feminist lifestyle, referring to young Korean women's practice of feminism as a lifestyle, encompassing an attitude to the personal mode of life and a worldview. Moreover, 
the feminist lifestyle aims to deploy political action toward freedom and equality. The rebooting of digital feminism among the young female population is due to social contradictions intertwined with women's lives in actual society. While some 80% of young Korean women have college degrees, gender inequality is aggravated to the extent that gender gap index, GGI, has kept Korea the worst ranked out of 118 OECD countries for 15 years. What is worse, the high advancement of digital technology has misled gender, gender culture among the younger generations of users in which cyber sexual harassment crimes are committed at serious levels against young women. Anger and fear of cyber sexual violence are pervasive among young women. These contradictions in women's social, political, and cultural aspect of life have led them to voluntarily engage in digital feminism in their day daily lives. I understand such young women's feminist lifestyle as an ethical, political movement toward happiness animated by this technology. My conceptualization of happiness is not individual property, but rather a diverse and collective assemblage of the effect, effect of becoming. Following the Deleuzean theory of effect, Happiness is a kind of affective power operating to leading the subject to move toward the exceptional and impossible through one's perseverance of vulnerability instead of being fixed or stopped in a position decided by the established order. Furthermore, happiness contains a critical subversiveness against the established order political imagination, which potentially creates something not yet in existence. From the perspective of ethics of happiness, women who join the Me Too movement are seen as having transformed themselves from those who are bodily offended to those who give voice to their truth telling. This feminism, including the Me Too movement, suggest the critical potentiality regarding the ethical value of happiness as that which should be more desperately imagined and acted upon because of one's very pre present vulnerability and promise of happiness in the future, as Sarah Ahmed said. Type 3, Homo economicus, microinvestment and microsubject. This area is related to the techno-economic condition of microinvestment, which is undergoing a great boom in Korea, particularly among the younger generation. I am interested in what I call the micro-subject, who is, in my suggestion, constituted in the digital capitalist integration of asceticization and digital platformization. The slogan of everyone becomes an investor and everything turns into asset are hard routinely everywhere in this condition. Microinvestment is a popular form of investment in the field of the assetization of art, music, and real estate. Thanks to the development of digital platforms, ordinary people with a small budget can join in the trend of investments such that one can buy in unit of 0.1 stock instead of one stock and can be given some profit allocation afterward. In Korea, about 20 micro investment platforms are operating with 10,000 to 30,000 users per platform at the cost of investment starting from less than one US dollars. It is reported that young people belonging to the gen generation occupy over one half of all micro investors dreaming of earning money 
by investing in pleasant things such as music, art building, in fancy areas, and so on. Without working, the world such as everyone, whenever, with the ease technological service, substantive and long-term profit, meaning the convenience and ubiquity that digital platforms provide, seduce young people to join this financial trend. Reselling is another item with which one can invest and earn money easily at little cost. Reselling is quite popular among young people in Korea due to the rise in major commercial corporate reselling platform. Most popular items for reselling are sneakers and luxury bags. Some resellers are in queues before some famous shops such as Chanel, as you see in the photo, open every morning. They rush into the shops as soon as they open, buy items and sell them online without using them at higher prices than the original one. An original price label should remain with that good. The reason for the popularity of reselling involves the logic of limited editions of these goods. Time limitations generate a scarcity of goods and stimulate the market to become competitive among those who indulge in luxury brands and buy these goods even more expensive prices than the original one without hesitation. The implications of micro-investment are as follows. Generation Z, called the MZ, Millennial Z in Korea, who is unstable in the labor market or rich enough not to work, but keen on cultural consumption is deeply involved in the trend of micro-investment. This means that micro-investment is the other side of social inequality in neoliberal capitalism. Microinvestment is mediated by digital platforms and cryptocurrency. The advancement of such financial technology enables a great number of people to engage in microinvestment. Technological convenience and luxury brand seduction work together to bring young investors and consumers the market of micro-investment. Therefore, an innovation, innovative future, which is highlighted in the discourse of micro-investment is a euphemism for instability and precarity in labor, excessive consumption, fragmentation in life, and micronization of the subject itself. The current techno-financial capitalism relentlessly innovates apparatuses through which poor citizens are incessantly seduced to transform the self into an investor, while digital platforms contribute to enhance the accessibility, feasibility, and ubiquity in the midst of economic polarization and regression. Such a contradictory condition is constitutive of the micro subject who keeps responding, serving, and getting excited and frustrated. A French philosopher, Lordon, calls such a capitalist subject a willful sl slave. The micro subject is a systemic product of financial capitalism and these platforms, as one well who operate in the logic of micro calculation throws the self toward the micro object and is crushed in a micronized financial technological order. Type four, homo residentia, the solitary and soft. Homo residentia is one who keeps herself distant from society, pursuing his and her own subjective lifestyle. This minoritarian life is featured in vegetarian diet, single life, or sexual minority status in relationships accompanied by an animal partner. It is important that the animal not be considered a simple pet, 
but that is called a cat partner or dog partner in the sense that the cat or dog displaces a married heterosexual human partner. A tendency towards soft feminism and environmentalism and calm resistance against capitalist consumerism. The character of homo residentia has significant popularity among the younger generation through what is called their daily vlogs. This type of daily vlog is characteristic with no face appearance and just a simple and minimalist mode of living. Everydayness in this context implies the subject unique exper experimentation of sense and sensibility, the action of making changing relations and defamiliarizing oneself from the normative definition of a good life. In my in-depth interviews of 14 daily vloggers, the characteristics of a homo, homo residentia may be explained as followed. Why should I show my face at all, even that I'm not a beauty vlogger? Korean people generally tend to evaluate others with faith on the basis of face. I do not want to be evaluated with my face. I have become more confident with my decision not to preach, provide my face on YouTube since my name has become well known on YouTube. Another interviewee says, my purpose of vlogging is recording my everyday life. So I think excessively beautified videos of everyday life are occurred. If I show my face, it will look unnatural too. This is the reason I try not to show my face. I do not like loud sounds either. This is why, I, why my vlogs are calm. The subjective life values rejection or the modern selection of advertisement on their daily vlogs, a calm and soft way of living, and minimalist expression in vlog aesthetics, all of which are constitutive of their calm dissent against the neoliberal capitalism, as Sark Rangier says. This alternative approach to everyday life signifies young people's attempt to make the ordinary extra extraordinary and invent alternative lifestyles to the capitalist norm of being a desirable family, worker, and consumer. This is a table characterizing four types of digital modus of event in five aspects. Each aspect is pursuit, digital activity, lifestyle, social relations, life values. Homo laborant, firstly, is characterized in practicality convenience, using practical services, balance in fun and benefit, networking and popularity, and pragmatism. Homo economicus is characterized with entrepreneurialism, innovative financial technological platforms, fluctuation in ambition and frustration, individual economic success, economic interest, and homo politicus is characterized with social change, solidarity networks, political and social movement and support, collectivity and collaboration, social change and political solidarity. And finally, homo residentia is featured in subjective aesthetism, self-expression channels, calm and distant minimalism, post-human or non-human friendly care of the self. In analyzing these four types of digital natives, I would like to suggest this. First, these types are constituted in articulation or disarticulation among social, economic, political, cultural, and technological realities. Many young people are technologically savvy, have an excessive desire for cultural consumption, 
but are economically precarious. Second, the crucial apparatus that leads their lives toward a certain direction is technology, especially their relation to digital platforms. The term digital native means not only they are born in the digital age, but, they, but that they have also grown up in the digital age. Thus, their lifestyle and worldviews cannot be the same as those of digital migrants. Both the risk of fragmentation, such as a microsubject, and the possibility of collectivity, such as a homopoliticus of digital feminism, are also deeply influenced, if not decided, by digital platform culture. This is why the idea of connected learning is crucial in the digital native world. How one can live together with different others, different in terms of economy, politics, culture, and social society, is highly dependent on how one is related to this platform culture in which various lifestyles are spontaneously or strategically cultivated. In particular, in the instance of homo laborant or homo entrepreneurial, neoliberal capitalism is highly influential in the formation of this capitalist subject among the younger generation. These categories are flexible and each category is mixed with the others on some occasions. For instance, homo laborants is often collaborate with the homo politicus in certain political events. When the ex-president of Korea was impeached in 2016, millions of people were connected online to come out in protest against the government. And although homo residential generally maintain a calm life, she contribute to social criticism of the established order deeply rooted in our everyday lives. Homo economicus is generally individualistic, indifferent to social politics, and often cries out in fear and frustration with regard to his speculative investment. However, in reality, we need to understand that both the excitement and anger he feels portend the danger and instability embedded in a risk society. In conclusion, technological connectivity is not identified with social co collectivity. Thus, we must try hard to invent and provide rich opportunities such that young people with a high technological connectivity can also learn to coexist and collaborate with different others to live together. In addition, we need a critical approach to the impact of the major forces of digital techno-capitalism to the formation of the subjectivity of digital natives. It seems obvious that digital techno-capitalism exerts a strong influence in forming ways of living among young people. And I would like to call for an alternative modus vivendi that keeps a critical distance from the capitalist order of work investment and consumption, and is generated in the ethical political creativity of living differently. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yeran, for your inspiring uh, presentation. And uh, people have must have been thinking a lot about um, your um, themes. And, and as you can see in the chat, there have been uh, many discussions uh, while you were speaking. And um, I'm wondering uh, uh, whether Mimi uh, would like to uh, speak about, uh, based on your um, comments and questions. Mimi, can you, can you uh, speak? Oh. Hi, yeah. Thank, thank you so much for your amazing talk and just the framework that you presented, which is really powerful and, 
I think it's particularly exciting for me because I had been doing fandom research earlier in Japan, you know, 15 years ago. And I feel like your work in Korea is um, the future. <laughs> it's where the, it's, uh, you're, it, things have moved and changed in ways that are really um, just interesting to hear uh, your perspective. Um, I had a really, you know, I, I was reflecting a lot in chat while you were speaking, but I had a really specific question, which is, you know, the homo resendetia, um, it, it reminds me a little bit about some of the uh, labels that we had in Japan, like hikikomori or otaku, which was very stigmatizing for young people, um, mostly men, you know, it was definitely gender male who were withdrawing from society and living a reclusive uh, digitally and pop popular culture connected life. Um, but what you described what seems just so different. And I was curious if that is something that you identified or is there a label for it in the culture? Is it recognized as a cultural trend? Is it considered negative? Is it valorized? I'd just love to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you. Shall I? Shall I? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you for your um, very insight. I totally agree with your comment because when I meet young people, um, the Japanese culture is very much influential among Korean young people. But a, a nuance is a little bit different. The hikikomori is very familiar to Korean young people as well. It seems very similar, but the young people that I met as daily vlogs are more social. They work, they go to company and they go for meet friends, but their lifestyle and their worldview is different. So it is not really entirely alienated alienated from society, but they want to keep distance from the major social trend like capitalism, money, a lot of competition, etc., etc. So uh, to recap, the cultural spirit or value is quite similar to Japanese young subculture, which is calm and very much subtle. Many young people like that but they are more socially working and early. So do you see the difference? They are not himikopori, they might joke themselves as a himikopori like, but actually they work as a citizen and worker and kind of social lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Michael wants to uh, ask a question. Yes, thank you, Hyun Son, and and thank you, Yaron, for such a um, a provocative and and wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it, and I think that um, the ways in which you're conceptualizing young people's experiences on digital platforms are, are really really interesting. Um, I my question is about regulation. Um, so part of what we were talking about in the chat was, you know, do given that young people are potentially in these precarious positions, you know, one, one response is to help to develop young people's media literacies. But on the other hand, also, there's probably a role for the regulation of digital platforms in different jurisdictions, so that there are a fewer opportunities for digital platforms to um, perhaps exploit young people. So, and, and of course, this is a big debate that's happening around the world now. I think about um, how in different countries platforms can be regulated. So I just wondered if you had any any thoughts on the question of regulation. Yes, thank you, Michael. Actually, your question is very crucial to contextualize this culture in Korean society or any other society. To me, the problem of regulation is not that much intertwined within this context because the people that I want to see is really legal activities like a vlog, YouTube, and lots of global social media. One thing is a, which has got 
very strange relationship to regulation is micro investment. This is not really legal or really non legal, but Korean. I don't know whether probably Michael may say a lot about this because a Korean government is in a position very subtle in an economic position. Korean government or society just are forced themselves to innovate something. So like a reselling platform or micro investment is kind of under, we say, we call it sandbox. So the government or society for economic reason just decided to leave, leave this like, so it uh, kind of regulation or discussion of legality is just stopped there. Probably two years or three years, uh, we will just leave it here and then just let people do this and let me see something like that. So it is not illegal at all. It is actually major commercial companies involved in there. So I don't see any regulation issue here. That's the problem actually. Regulations in economy or society or education, it's just a stop there as far as I know. I wonder whether is there something like exists in Australia or other societies. I just think that technological capitalism is advanced first and then law or social norms are following them. So it is quite quick change everything. Uh, okay, thank yes. you. Yeah. Okay, Michael, go on. No, no, it's fine. Um, please, please go on. Okay, uh, there was uh, another question from John O'Cole. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes, John, would you like to ask the question? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, yeah, for uh, the presentation. You made me to start to think of a whole lot of things, especially, uh, well, um, our culture and context might actually be a bit different, but what you talking about, about young people, it's very resonating um, in a place like Nigeria also. So I, I, I'm actually thinking from the entrepreneurship perspective, uh, uh, I, I have this basic thing that I look at. Uh, most young people using technological uh, uh, affordances don't really, don't really think of it as, oh, this is being paid for by some uh, somewhere, somehow, partly with their parents and all that. They keep using uh, those platforms or they keep depending on others, like their elders and adults to get to be using the technology. But uh, from an entrepreneurship perspective or from the perspective that they need to be responsible to actually use this to build capacity in terms of uh, uh, entrepreneur uh, capability, I've not seen it very much there. So when you talk about social collectivity, how can we induce uh, entrepreneurship into young people? Thank you. Thank you. That's quite uh, challenging, right? Because I believe that that question, how to induce these potentially creative humans uh, to develop their own work and found their values. I think that's really this, that will decide our civilization in the future. Actually, I see lots of potentiality among young people. And actually this is connected with uh, my access as before, because this, kind of education of these young people because I met normally 20 people in the 20s and the university education is a very much a responsibility for this. But Korean government and the environment of Korea university is kind of stimulate them to start their own job work rather than get employed. 
this kind of creativity policy is one item. And I see actually many young people are more interested in making their own company, like a startup or venture, whatever, than to get employed by the uh, established companies. And there might be some possibility that their creativity and kind of innovation will develop and actually open up in society. But after that, we also need to consider because a startup is a startup. We don't know what's going on after starting up. So this kind of precarity and instability, especially after the pandemic, the global society is quite in a crisis. Every day is a crisis, crisis, crisis. And young people are induced or forced to be creative and start something as their own independent power. This kind of contradiction needs to be resolved in um, cooperation among different generations. Yeah, and, and while we are waiting for other questions, I have a question actually. Um, because you are a university teacher or so, you are teaching these young people in your class. You know? So I'm wondering how you are trying to be connected with these young people by asking uh, questions based on your observations and your research and how try um, and if you are finding uh, uh, like um, ways to connect these differently tribed um, mm -hmm. digital um, lives of young people. Uh, this can be a question related to the educators or parents or adults role uh, trying to have conversations with these young people. That's my question. Thank you, Anzan. That's quite um, important question to me because the, the four types that I share, shared with you were made through my conversation with the student because the, each module was analyzed for last four, seven years and each topic was developed from my conversation, from my student work. When I asked them in my class, what is your interest these days? Seven years ago, everyone wants to be supporter, <laughs> like digital laborants. And I became interested in what supporter and they explained, oh, well, I'm working and I'm doing low, et cetera, et cetera. And I get into getting excited with that phenomena and research it in. And I interviewed, most interviews are my students actually. The, the residential is like that. It was like four years ago, just before the pandemic, just my students lost their interest in very excitement on YouTube. They begin to just everyone says that I'm doing daily vlog or I'm watching daily vlog. So I ask them, what's daily vlog? And they say, oh, is it this kind of thing? Like Mimi said, is it kind of Japanese youth culture styles? YouTube is just in trend. And I was interested. I met them and I found that very much big story is going on. The point that I getting lost is homo. Invest, investment department, uh, investment phenomena. Because when I met 40 students in this spring term, I asked them how many people doing reselling and at least the five students hand up and saying that they sell something on the uh, platform. And I surprised because I, read a lot of reselling on newspaper, but I didn't imagine that actually students are doing that and they earn money like several hundred dollars, et cetera, et cetera. So I found that actually students are 
really really this model <laughs> and they sometimes after the pandemic we lost contact with young people right even in the class and they actually has gone so far and i don't understand anymore i'm very much isolated individualistic and capitalist model is much more major than before so i'm thinking a lot these days how we start to connect with young people after the pandemic, especially. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And there was um, a um, comment from Anne. Um, uh, shall I read it? Uh, so this has been a very powerful presentation. I'm very interested in intersectionality of nuanced impacts. So Anne is currently seeing these dynamics at play within the rural to urban migrant uh, dysphoria and displaced communities. And uh, Anne, would you like to uh, say more about this? Um, okay, I um, gave, yeah. Okay, Anne, please go ahead. So my question is, um, have you, observe some of this with uh, youth that are coming back from having lived abroad, because I'm noticing a, layers of similar experience amongst various groups. I, I, I work with intersectional groups and largely refugee, indigenous, displaced youth. And a lot of what you're, you've mentioned is happening. For in 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 spaces within the rural to urban context. Right. So in terms of youth coming back having studied abroad, is 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 this is this similar in any way from what you have observed? Yeah. It's quite actually imaginative question because even I didn't say in this presentation, I feel there is a kind of connection in that direction. For example, actually, you could feel that these four models are regrouping in two groups. For example, homo residentia and homo politicus sometimes go together. They are, if we understand them in an ideological aspect, homo residentia and homo politicus are relatively progressive and left and homo laborant and homo economicus are quite right, right wing and conservative. And Anna says that they sometimes go abroad and want to leave their own country are very strong in the, in the left former, which is homo residentia and homo politicus. Five years ago, before pandemic, just many people, daily vloggers, come together with travel, what we call it, traveling vlog. They just go to other countries and just spend their time in a very honest, um, very minimalist lifestyle. And in that, it may look very individualistic or solitary, but I could feel that there is a very strong um, idea criticizing Korean capitalist or conservative order. So this kind of operation is going on. And when some political or social event occur like migrant problems or refugee, et cetera, et cetera, this homo residentia, homo politicus is quite a support to accept them, but homo laborers or homo economicus it's quite against them. So this kind of modus vivendi is quite easily articulated and combined with the political ideology of position. I believe that, thank you. Yeah, uh, that was a great question and response. And I'm just aware of the time limits. And, and so, uh, but there was um, uh, other questions Then I, I will keep all uh, these uh, questions and, and, um, and send, uh, uh, send to Yeran and 
hopefully we can exchange uh, the uh, answers uh, afterwards. And thank you very much, uh, Yeran, and then and all the attendees uh, for the great questions and responses. And thank you very much. Or and we are uh, wrapping up now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for and thank you, Yansang. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. I will see everyone leave. <laughs> oh, yes, me too. I will stay with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. It was really great. Thank you for your hard work. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm really pleased that um, uh, there were lots and lots of in, uh, inspirational uh, questions raised. And then yes. on there, uh, Michael's um, uh, question and observation was that, uh, and, and, and with me, we need like media literacy for like um, political economy of digital uh, culture. Uh, yeah, that's a very big question, right? Mm -hmm. I really like to empty that question, but it was a very good comment, which mm -hmm. I have to try. And I like Mimi's question as well, because yes. she opens up the sessions Q&A and give me very good historical context. So out there are 10 people. Yeah. yeah. OK. So uh, shall we leave now? Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you